can't actually take it out and stuff there. That would have been good, wouldn't it? Good beginning, just rolling around on the floor, wrestling with the microphone. So it's good to see a bit of revolution in Pembrokeshire. Yay! It's good to see you're all revolting. Don't take it personally, Pembrokeshire. So, so, uh, Christmas is a coming. Sorry to break that uh, to you. Christmas is coming. And do you know how I know? I know because um, I was doing a gig the other day in Birmingham and um, drove past a massive billboard advertising Christmas special lap dances <laughs> at Spearmint Rhino. Christmas special lap dance at Spearmint Rhino. I thought, wow, I wonder what that would entail a Christmas special lap dance. Just a bit of, you know, a bit of twirling, a bit of that, a bit of the old, you know, in the face. Here's your mince pie. <laughs> I don't know. Or perhaps the ping pong trick featuring Ferrero Rocher. What do you think? <laughs> oh, one again. Please stop. No, really, you're spoiling us. No, you really are. Absolute filth. But you know, I, I, I love, oh, someone's, give, someone's aiding me live on stage. Oh, bless you. Oh, give this man a round of applause. I love you. I dedicate the show to you, microphone salvaging person. Thank you, because now I can nervously pace around. Thank God for that. Thank God. So yes, yeah, I would love to be a lap dancer actually, but confession here, confession live on stage. Not because um, I kind of like the idea of sexually objectifying myself for money, but just, well, maybe a little bit of that, you know. But, uh, but, but just have that confidence, just that confidence, that body confidence. Um, I'd love that because, because gravity has been a rather cruel mistress to one such as myself, a slightly well-endowed lady. I don't, don't so much wear underwired bras, these days, as, as I've had sort of small Grecian pillars formed <laughs> to uphold things. And, and as I've got older, I've sort of become more like the human equivalent of the back of the sofa, actually. No, I really have. I sort of find things. <laughs> I take my clothes off at the end of the day and, and lift my boobs up to take my top off and, and a, a pound will fall out. Lovely. Brilliant. Oh, I'll save that for the trolley later. Excellent. Meow! Oh my god! I found the cat! It's okay, I found the cat. <sighs> Jesus, I just thought I had a thrush again. <laughs> Bringing sexy back. Hi. <laughs> Strap in. <laughs> Thanks. I think I've set the bar there. Fairly low, let's face it. So we're here to disturb, <laughs> to discuss. Stephen Crabb, not really my pendulous breasts, but I do like to mention them whenever I can. <laughs> Love it. I think there's a lady over there who might, might understand what I'm going through. Do you know, I was... <laughs> fuck it, I'll carry on on that theme, it's getting a laugh. <laughs> I was invited to do burlesque, actually, uh, a couple of years ago. It was just a shocking, traumatic experience uh, for myself and everybody there. My friend had hit 40 and had obviously just reached that point of just thinking, fuck it, you know what I mean? He's gone past the kind of hanging on to youth, you know, with fake fingernails and fake tan. Just thought, fuck it all, I'm just going to get it all out and sort of twirl it around in front of my friends. Um, and it we all had to sort of think of, of a burlesque name. And um, I couldn't think of one, but by the end, it was Apologetic Milf. <laughs> no, honestly. I was kind of knocking people out next to me whilst dancing. It was terrible. Um, you know, had I really gone for it, there was a chance I'd have taken off and hit the back of the room as they'd gone off like a pair of propellers. <laughs> Hey-ho. But anyway, we really aren't here to discuss my pendulous breast, so let's move on from that to discuss Stephen Crabb. Yes, Stephen Crabb. I have plenty of, of unprocessed rage. Daddy didn't love me enough, so let's just take some of it out on someone who actually does deserve it, Stephen Crabb. Now, I'm sure I don't have to reel off the sort of list of, frankly, atrocities that this man has been, has been party to. Um, I'm sure we all, we all know. But it's, it's interesting that he does this in the guise of a, of a fundamentalist Christian. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, that in itself is hilarious, I agree. And he clearly sort of missed the Sunday school session um, about, you know, having to take care of those less fortunate than yourself, who's probably at home killing ants with a magnifying glass. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, die, weak scum. Um, but it's... <laughs> He's sort of carried on in that vein, hasn't he, really? But I think it's easy, it's easy, it's obvious to me how we can unseat crab. Um, we just need a fishing line, one of those small little net bags. Um, and we just need to fill it with the sort of inner thigh shavings of, of young, impoverished children. And we just throw it at him and he won't be able to resist grabbing hold and thus we can yank him off. Not in that way, not in that way. <laughs> And that's how we can do it. No, no, no it's, it's a dark and horrible thing to say, I, I realise that, but it is a dark and horrible subject matter, um, discussing, discussing the Tories. Um, and, and, it, and I am fascinated by the fact that he claims to be a fundamentalist Christian. Um, and, and he's kind of decided, hasn't he, you know, we've heard Josh talking about this and Paul, that the, the, the gay conversion, gay conversion is the way to go. And I've kind of thought about this. And I think what he's doing is, is sort of religiously offsetting. Uh, it's a bit like carbon offsetting. Um, you know, you take lots of plane flights, it's fine, you just plant lots of trees, it's okay. You take money from those less fortunate than yourself, it's okay. You just convert some gays, just to sort of redress the balance a little bit. But why, why indeed has he chosen to homosexuality? Why has he cherry-picked this from all of the teachings from the Bible? And I think it's obvious, with that neat little beard, slightly tight-fitting suit trousers. I don't think he's fooling anybody at all, actually. I don't think he is. Come out of the closet, Stephen. Closeted gay, that's a funny sort of term, isn't it? Closeted gay. I can't even imagine some sort of homosexual wearing a closet whenever I do that. Here's the grain, the grain, it kind of picks out the highlights in my head. It's a bastard when I want to sit down. Just come out, come out, Stephen. Come out the closet. Come into 2017 where difference is celebrated as diversity. Come out, Stephen, where tolerance is a more important currency than dominance. Come out, Stephen, into a world where you no longer have to imagine your wife's fanny is a bumhole. My money's on, Reese Moore. Yeah. Yes, I really did say that live on stage. I'm available for children's parties. Yes. <laughs> but now, to avoid disappointment, <laughs> come out, Stephen. And, and on that note, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a poem for you, a few lovely people tonight. And it's about it's about gender identity. Um, my little girl, she's 12 years old. Um, meaning that I'm not doing the enough, do I? I don't answer that. Thanks. Um, so the smell of sort of burgeoning hormones does waft through our house like a sort of potpourri of doom. Um, and it's, it's become a very difficult <laughs> process being, being a parent, really, really difficult. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult when they're really little, obviously. You're just trying to stop them killing themselves by eating fag butts or whatever it is, you know, training them up to bring you wine from the fridge. It's really hard, it's really difficult. Um, <laughs> but it remains difficult. As they get older, you tell yourself it's going to get easier, but it, it doesn't. It metamor no, it doesn't metamorphose. It mutates. Metamorphosis sounds lovely, like a butterfly. No, it mutates, frankly, into something just as difficult because it becomes psychological. They use guilt as a way of, of getting their own way, and my, my little girl's brilliant at doing that. Oh, thank God for that. My mouth was getting all dry with nerves, so I was starting to do that thing where your lip kind of sticks to your teeth like that and you can't actually speak without sounding like you have a terrible speech impediment. Brilliant. That's gone. So, <laughs> so my little girl, she's, she's brilliant. She's brilliant at, uh, at psychological sort of warfare. Kind of like a kind of guilt terrorist um, at the age of 12. But they do, she does come out with these profound statements sometimes. And she said to me recently, she said, Mum, I don't feel like I align particularly with, with girls or with boys, you know? I'm, I'm gender fluid, this term, heard this term, very modern, modern term, down with the kids. I, I'm not down with the kids, actually. The only time I'm down with the kids is if I'm helping them clean sick up off the floor or something like that. Um, 
But, but yeah, gender fluid, gender fluid. And uh, I thought, okay, that's, that's cool. And she said to me, she said, Mum, thing is, I feel, because I don't really relate to either gender, I feel like a gender refugee. That's profound. I thought, wow, yeah, that's profound, Poppy. Let me just, let me just bask in the glory of that. Yeah, you're from this womb. Brilliant, excellent, <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> profound. And, and I wrote this poem, I wrote this poem after thinking about this. Um, and, and I called it The Man Who Was a Chaise Long. It's a great big metaphor, but I'm sure you'll get it by the end. Have voiced lovely, lovely people. And it goes a little something like this. When they were boys, Alan's brothers used to play with toys. Worlds imagined, destroyed. He-Man, Spudgum, even the Millennium Falcon. But Alan lived outside the norm. His engagement with objects was met with scorn. What the hell is wrong with him? His mother would shout. She was, in fact, Terry James from Monty Python. I've no idea, Pamela, but I'm in no doubt it's just a fad. You see, the thing that was driving the Wilmots mad was that it seemed dovetailed into their son's nature to actually want to be an item of furniture. His static stance was noted early on. He crouched down beside the couch with nothing but cushions on. Hours and hours would be whiled away in the same position he would stay. And at dinner time, he'd declare, going firmly against his human grain, that he felt more akin to fabric and wood. And when asked if happy, he'd simply utter, so far so good. <laughs> Play more where that came from. As his teens flushed out his childhood, the spud gun's ammunition spent, the rejection in He-Man's ego more than just a dent. Girls became his brother's passion, smooth bodies became hairier in fashion, consumed substances revealed their consciousness had multiple flaws, while Alan experimented with becoming a chest of drawers. <laughs> he struggled though to settle and find inner peace. He tried a wardrobe, a dressing table and finally a mantelpiece. And he was in this state when his great aunt Myrtle died. She'd been old, isolated, and at her funeral, only really her daughter cried. And that was when her will was read. Earthly materials handed out no longer needed now that she was dead. And that was when it came into their lives, their home, a chaise long, fake walnut, reupholstered with cheap jacquard and memory foam. But to Alan, it was a thing of utter beauty, such stirrings he'd never experienced himself. And as a mantelpiece, he gazed upon it and said, when I look at you, I want to touch my shelf. <laughs> but to regard just wasn't enough. He really had to be this thing to achieve a state of self-love. So that was it. He legally changed his status. Alan was gone. It made national news. The headline, Man Becomes Shays Long. His parents were utterly perplexed. His mother sought psychological help to see if his ways could be flexed. The shrink cast many questions and pondered notions of an inability to cope with reality and the full range of human emotions. She asked about early childhood experiences. Had there been any untoward interferences? No, nothing extraordinary came to light. Alan was uncategorizable, all right. She'd heard, of course, of those being gender misaligned, had even heard of those who felt more comfortable relating as the feline kind. His father chipped in. You don't suppose it's something to do with his brain? You know, the science of the neuro. Mind you, you don't think it's that he was conceived up against the bureau? <laughs> well done. They didn't know what the bureau was, actually, when I did that cagging at Swansea. On a higher level. That idea was dismissed as quickly and easily as it had come, and in the end it was decided that Alan was happy and that nothing need be done. You see, the problem parents often have, said Dr Valerie Bunn, is that they project their own version of acceptable onto their young, and the solution comes when acceptance is given regardless of behavioural type or however mad you've been driven. You see, the answer is not to love the child you want, but the one that you've been given. Oh. I love that I've got an R at the end. You're lovely, aren't you? Of course we are. We're lovely, lefty, lovely types of people. Well done, us. Well done, us. <laughs> yeah, give yourself.
yourselves a round of applause, you veg growing, salad eating darlings. Well done. Well done. But genuinely, it is good to see some momentum. It's good to see people coming together. It really is, you know, it really is good to see a bit of revolution in Pembrokeshire. And you've strapped in for the long ride. Are you all here for all day? You all here? Wow. Love you, and you've still managed to laugh with people talking. I love you. Well done.